philosophers who state with confidence that miracles occur all around us every day. And that with a heightened awareness, we will be able to see these miracles, recognize the angels that walk among us. I'm Robert Culp. The Bible records many spectacular miracles. Moses, leading his people from slavery in Egypt, negotiated with the Pharaoh and performed several miracles in the process, and in the final escape, parted the Red Sea, then closed it again on the advancing Egyptian army. In this age of scientific knowledge, many argue that miracles no longer occur. They can't because those events now have explanations. At the Miracle Research Center, the staff examines miraculous events in today's world, which seemingly have no explanation and ask the question, could it be a miracle? Hello, I'm Michelle Wolford, segment producer for Could It Be a Miracle? And I'm Bob Evans, producer. Our Miracle Research team members, video crews, writers, directors, producers, are hard at work both here in the studio and in the field, collecting real life stories for your consideration. In today's show, I have interviews with authors and miracle experts, Joan Wester Anderson and Karen Goldman. In addition, we'll examine stories that seem to indicate miraculous possibilities. These include a young girl in desperate need of medical help and the mysterious signs that lead her to it. by calls for help from her daughter miles away. A ghostly grandmother saves her grandson's life. A college girl is rescued by the appearance of her deceased boyfriend. A nurse is confronted by a violent patient and saved by a miraculous call. And a young boy is near death, losing the battle against a life-threatening disease. For our first segment, Michelle traveled to Chicago to visit with best-selling author Joan Wester Anderson. Joan has written four books on the subject of the miraculous, and our latest story comes from her book, Where Miracles Happen. There's a terrific story about uh, a family that went out to Yellowstone to have a vacation, the uh, Graham and Grandpa, and then the young couple and a little girl, their daughter Emily, who was four or five at the time. And on their way back, they're going through a real desolate area around Montana. some 40 miles away, you know, when you're out in this desolate area. Well, they assumed that it would be a, a small town, but maybe there would be a clinic there or something they could get too fast. So they really stepped on the gas and started zooming. And they 
they went faster and faster, and they continued to pray and just ask help that, that this little girl would be okay until they got there. Is this it? Is this the time we're looking for? Yeah, I, I think this is it. It's got to have a hospital. Look for signs. Look, there's a hospital sign right there. All of a sudden, right on their right, was one of those blue and white universal hospital signs. There's another one. And they followed it and led to another one. And this was kind of tricky because they had to go on an expressway and then get off it again. And without those signs, they never would have made it. And sure enough, these little blue and white, uh, almost like little signals, led them all the way to the emergency room door. Emily, honey, you're gonna be fine. Look, there's a hospital Hang sign. on for mommy. Thank God. Whatever her problem was, it was something that could be helped by medication, but they wanted her to stay overnight. How is she? She could be a lot worse. She suffered an epileptic seizure. Oh, Abby. We've done a CAT scan, and we stabilized her with anticonvulsant drugs. It's a good thing that you got her here so soon. She was awake long enough just to tell me about Yellowstone Park. <laughs> <laughs> She'll need a rest now, though. Where are you from? Nebraska. We really would have been lost without those signs. What signs? The blue and white hospital signs. They led us right to the door. Mr. and Mrs. Whiteman, there are no hospital signs. Not in this town. No, we all saw the signs. I've been trying to get the city for the last five years to post the signs. I realize that the hospital is difficult to find. Unfortunately, I don't think that we're at the top of their priority list. She'll be fine now, though. Thank you, Doctor. Yes. quieted down and then the dad and the grandpa decided that they would go and get get the car gassed up and ready for the next day. When her husband and her father came back from gassing up the car they were quite late. They said that they had assumed that they could follow the hospital signs right back to the hospital but there weren't any at all. I am not losing it. It was there. It was there Bob. How is she? She's doing great, Dad. You guys have been a long time. Well, um, Bob doesn't want to admit this, but he, uh, we got lost. It's the craziest thing, Marlene. I mean, I could have sworn we were on the same road that brought us here the first time. Except, uh... Except what? We didn't see a single hospital sign. Not a single one. Doesn't make any sense. Pops and I, we chalked it to a combination of panic and fatigue. We all saw those signs, as clear as day. The very next day, Marlene called the Chamber of Commerce because she thought they are the ones who will solve this dilemma for us. She explained the whole situation to them and asked, did we get turned around? Did my husband and father-in-law come in from a different way? Or does this doctor take another road than the one we were on? She was told no. There were no blue and white hospital signs ever erected in that town and they were never there again. So these signs were heaven sent. They've always felt. So the Weichmans feel it was a miracle. They do, and Joan is convinced as well. Well, it's an amazing story. And coming right up, another story that's equally amazing. A mother is out of town on vacation with her husband when she's awakened by her daughter's cries for help, even though her daughter is miles away. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle. We first heard about our next file from Brad Steiger and Sherry Hansen Steiger, co-authors of Amazing Moms. Brad shared with our staff this story of a daughter's desperate cry for help. This particular story of a mother's love, we have a situation where, you know, a mother should be able to relax. Children are grown, the youngest one is in college, home on break. Dad's been wanting to get away, take this trip for the longest time, just the two of them. 
Fabian, I don't know. It's so last minute. Oh, honey, look. I've got one business meeting. Then the rest of the time is ours to have fun. Come on, what do you say, huh? What do you say? But it's Mary's first time home from college. Morning. Did you just hear my name? Yeah, well, we'll just let Marty decide. Decide what? Well, I got called away on a business meeting, right? And it's two days at a beach resort, no less. Wow. Yeah. And I thought it'd be fun to have Mom come along. Mom, that does sound like fun. But it's your first college break. Uh, Mom, I'm here for 10 days. You should go with Dad. I can use this time to dig into a term paper or something. Yeah, she can order pizza in, watch movies and stuff. Anyway, when's the last time that we went off together somewhere? Well... I guess you're right. Of course he's right. You should go. <laughs> All right. So they finally get started. They get a late start. Dad's pretty impatient with that, but, you know, what can he do? Are you sure you're going to be okay, Marty? I'll be fine, Mom. You two just go and have a good time, okay? Good come time. on, come on, come on, sweetheart. I want to get to at least before. Okay, okay. Bye-bye. Okay. I'll call you as soon as we get there. Here. If you ever get there, go. Get that fun. Mother and father didn't get that far because they got such a late start. So she said, uh, you know, let's check into a motel. You know, honey, I know you can drive it easily the next day. And he says, okay, because he realized he's kind of lost the battle for that day anyway. Might as well check in, get a good night's sleep. They'll start the next morning. But they get into the motel and, and she starts in again. She says, I just feel so uneasy about leaving Marty alone. Do you think we should call Marty and see how she's doing? She's doing fine. We can call her when we get to the resort. Okay, Fabian. Oh, let's get to sleep, sweetheart. Oh, we got to start in the morning. Good night, Fabian. Good night, sweetheart. Kiss, kiss. And she can't really sleep. She keeps waking up, thinking of Marty at home. You know, there's just something wrong. There's just something not right. And her husband keeps saying, well, you know, that's natural. You know, she's your baby, and she's home, and you're just, it's natural to feel that way. But you know, everything's okay. But then she gets this message. Hello? Hello yourself. Who is this? Well, hey there, lady. Don't you sound sweet. Put your daddy on the line. He's busy right now. Not too busy for me, sweet thing. Now put him on, okay? Hello? Let's not play games, lady. I'm not gonna ask you again. Put your daddy on the phone. clearly say and kind of not really a dream she's not really awake it's that kind of in-between stage that you have and she hears her daughter say oh mom I wish you were here I wish you were home and boy that does it
Now open up. Mom, please come home. She hears it again. Mom, I wish you were here. She will have it now no other way. There's nothing left now but for them to leave the motel and to drive all the way back home. Well, and he realizes, you know, when mom is that set and she says, no, I heard Marty say, mom, I wish you were here. And there was fear in our daughter's voice. So he gives in. They start to drive all the way back. Police! <laughs> He's in bed getting his beauty rest. Open up or I'm gonna kick the door in. I'm gonna count to three. The police will be here any second. One. Two. Sure, the patrol cars are out there, but they aren't out there continually because they're they come back every few minutes what if the guy's just down the block what if he's hiding in the bushes he could be there at any minute at the door so again she says mom i wish you were here i wish you were here why did i tell you to leave and that cry that cry of terror goes out and as we saw was received mom did pick it up where uh, harm may not have occurred, but the terror was very real. And that's what reached across the miles and brought mother back to her daughter's arms and again for, for harmony at home. Brad and Sherry Steiger's research is formidable. We consider them a valuable tool here at the Miracle Research Center. And we'll be back with more files in a moment. A man injures himself in a fall with no possibility of rescue until his grandmother makes a ghostly appearance. And later, a boy makes a miraculous medical recovery with the help of a mysterious child from the past. Welcome back. Our next segment concerns a man who revisits his boyhood home. A trip down memory lane takes a dangerous turn. And his rescue goes beyond nostalgia into the realm of the miraculous. As a boy, Willie August and his grandmother had a special relationship. Okay, so we're ready. We're gonna just see what it says. Okay, my magic ring tells me that you'll find new friends if you explore that alley up there. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, let's go. Magic ring was right. See, I told you. Years later, Willie visited his old neighborhood again, this time as a city engineer whose job it was to supervise the demolition of the very building where he had once lived as a boy. His old apartment had long since been abandoned, but it still contained memories of his father, mother, and especially his grandmother. So real were these memories, he could almost touch them. Though 30 years had passed since her death, in his memory, there she was, as alive and vibrant as ever. 
It was so real, so innocent, and a dangerous distraction. <laughs> Willie fell through rotted wood floors into the basement of the building. The fall broke several ribs and Willie sustained internal injuries. He lay unconscious and bleeding to death. Several miles away, a policeman on routine patrol met a persuasive lady. Can I help you, ma'am? Yes, it's my grandson. He needs help. Please hurry. You mean your son? No, my grandson. Right. Where to? 105th and Sturdivant. I don't think anybody still lived in that area. Wait, please hurry. in there. But you were just... In the basement. Just... Hey, friend, can you hear me? The policeman found me? Willie, recognized his serious condition, and called for an ambulance. Dispatch, this is 311. I have a 1038. Repeat, a 1038. Over. As Willie was taken to the hospital by the paramedics, the officer realized the woman who had alerted him was gone. But on his car seat, he discovered a ring. A few days later, the officer and Willie August met face to face so that Willie could say thank you and the officer could share the curious story of his rescue. Uh, don't thank me. Thank your grandmother. My grandmother? <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, this woman, she flagged me down, said her grandson was in trouble. Yeah, you know, I thought it seemed a little strange because she didn't look old enough to be a grandmother, but when we got there, she told me to go inside, even told me you were in the basement. That's impossible. First of all, when I went to that building, I was by myself, and, and no one knew I was in the basement. And secondly, my grandmother died 30 years ago. Well, who knows? There, there's a lot of strange people in this town. Oh, by the way, I found this on the car seat where she was sitting. It must have belonged to her. Are you all right? This ring. It belonged to, to my grandmother. She said she'd come back. Coming up in the next half hour, Michelle's interview with author Karen Goldman and her story of a young man who reaches out from beyond the grave to save his girlfriend. And don't forget our remarkable account of a boy and his mysterious healer. Stay tuned for more miracles. Walt Whitman was born on Long Island in 1819 into a large family. Though never formally educated, he read voraciously and at age 17 taught school. In 1855, Walt Whitman published his first book of poetry, Leaves of Grass. Touched deeply by the Civil War, Whitman expanded Leaves of Grass and it was soon recognized as the work of a genius. The poetry was unrestricted and described the very hearts of the people of the country. Of miracles, Walt Whitman said, to me, every hour of the light and dark is a miracle. Every cubic inch of space is a miracle. Our researchers are using all of their hours to seek out miracles and bring them into the light. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle? In this half hour, we'll present more intriguing stories, as well as Michelle's one-on-one -on -one interview with Karen Goldman. I went to Arizona to visit with Karen in her home, where we discuss this next case from her book, Angel Encounters. Karen, you've written a number of books on the subject of angels, dealing with angelic visions, healings, angelic rescues. What exactly is an angelic encounter? 
when when the divine steps into your life and into your soul and either makes a change in your physical life or your emotional well-being and um, some are subtle, some are very dramatic. Monica, wait up. Jeez, Monica, what planet are you on? I called your name like three times. Sorry, Stace. I'm in my own world today. Thinking about exams? Actually, I was thinking about Greg. It'll be the one-year anniversary of his death tomorrow. Jeez, Monica, don't torture yourself. There was nothing you could do for him then. Thinking about it now won't bring him back. He was my best friend in the whole world, Stacy. How could he kill himself? How could he leave without saying goodbye? I don't know the answer to that question, Monica. Wish I did. Hey, what do you say? Girls' night out? It is Friday. Thanks, Stacy, but um, I think I'd rather be alone today. got to bed about 10 o'clock every night, and she was just exhausted, and she'd sleep really soundly. But one night, about 11, she was awakened by a voice, and she opened her eyes, and there was her friend Greg. saying goodbye. How could you do that to me? What do you want me to say? That it's okay? That I don't miss you? After that, she said that Greg came into her dreams frequently, and he'd just sit down in whatever the dream was. You know, he'd sit down and have a cup of coffee or whatever, and it just meant a lot to her to have to know that he was with her. And she feels that he's one of her angels now. The apparition, Greg's ghost, saved Monica. Yes, and provided Monica with the affirmation that the deep affection she and Greg shared was still very much alive. When we come back, a nurse in a mental institution finds herself in a precarious situation, and through a miracle, a co-worker hears her call for help. My guardian angel is, I think it's a girl, and um, they help me with most of my bad times and good times are not there. That's good because I don't need them at good times and at bad times. I really need them because, like, if I get hurt or something, I just want someone to have and have someone to be with and stuff. So that's how I think my guardian angel is. 
We're back at the Miracle Research Center, and Michelle, you've got another story for us. Yes, I met with Joan Wester Anderson, who has detailed many accounts of angelic interventions in her books. This next story takes us to a state mental hospital in Massachusetts, where a nurse finds herself face to face with danger. There's a story of a medical technician named Edie who worked in a home for the mentally disturbed. And when a new patient was admitted, they had a regular routine where um, someone from the admitting office would come, as well as a nurse from the ward where the patient would be put. Um, it was just all kind of something that they always did to protect themselves. Uh, Edie usually worked with a large orderly named Dan. Uh, she always felt very safe when Dan was around her because some of the patients could get a little violent at times, but that was Dan's job. He was kind of assigned to her. Lily, I guess this is it. I can't believe they changed my shift tonight. Oh, they're going to stick me with some new tech after all our years together. You know my funny habits and I know your little quirks. And I have to work nights with a complete stranger. Whoever you work, we should feel very, very lucky. Thanks, Edie. Hey, thank you for all your help. I really appreciate it. Just hope this new guy is half the tech man you are. I guess I'm out here. I gotta go get a nap before I start my shift tonight. I'll miss you, Dan. Bye. Well, one night, Dan was over at one of the other buildings when a call came in that, that they were bringing someone to admit him. Here we are, home sweet home. Hey, how you doing? You got another customer for you. It's an emergency call, lady. I was told to pick him up and bring him here. Hey, my tech isn't even here yet. You know hospital policy. Gotta do it with the tech. Come on, lady. It's my last drop off. I just got off the graveyard ship. Give me a break. Now look at him. He's harmless. Can't you do this for me? Where's his paperwork? Yeah, they're all here. Can you take it from here? Guess I have no choice. So she started doing the intake work on him. Hi, I'm Nurse Murphy. You can call me Edie, though. What's your name? All right, then. Why don't we get you settled into your room? You must be tired. Would you like to come with me, please? All of a sudden, he lunged at her. All of a sudden, there was Dan. And Dan subdued the guy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm fine. I, I, you, you know, one minute he was okay, and then the next minute he was... It was stupid. I shouldn't have tried to admit it myself. Well, he's sleeping like a baby now. Good. Where's your new tech? Never showed up. Thanks, Dan. Don't know what I would have done if you hadn't been there. How did you know I was over the rehab ward and not at home sleeping? What are you talking about? When you called five minutes ago. And he said, what do you mean you got my phone call? He said, well, the phone rang on the ward. One of the nurses picked it up and said, Dan, it's Edie. This is Dan. Dan, I need your help. Please hurry. I'll be right there. I'll be right there. I'll be right there. I'll be right there. Edie. Dan, I never called you. I didn't call anybody. Then who called me? So there is a lovely little legend and a belief in some quarters that sometimes your guardian angel, if he or she is seen, looks like you or sounds like you. And in this case, we speculated that perhaps uh, Edie's guardian angel made that call and simply summoned Dan the easiest way possible by sounding just like Edie. We've reviewed files where family members were called to action through miraculous means, but in this case, it was close friends. Coming up next, a young boy is losing the fight against Rye syndrome, and a miracle is his last hope.
For our next file, Bob has a story about a young boy in the grips of a deadly illness. Doctors were doubtful that the boy would ever recover from the disease that threatened to claim his life. But the doctors never counted on a miracle. In the hospital room, little Tommy McGivern was very ill with Rice syndrome. That reminds me of my, my dad's farm. Thank you. I, uh, I also called the archdiocese and asked for a loan of this relic. It's a medallion that belonged to Bishop John Newman. Bishop who? The patron saint of Philadelphia. If you'd been raised in Philly, you'd know his name as well as you know Babe Ruth. He did a lot of good for this city, and the people loved him very much. They say that such a relic can be a blessing at times like these. Well, thank you, Father. This means a lot to me and Mike. This might be the only hope we've got. Later, Mrs. McGivern woke from a restless sleep to discover a mysterious boy standing by her son's bed. Who are you? went off. I mean, the monitors indicate that he's been through a major change, but I can't see any discernible difference in his condition. I want you to run me some fresh diagnostics and get me the cardiac monitor tape for the last five minutes. Exhaustion and concern for her son had worn on Mrs. McGivern. The jigsaw puzzle offered her an escape, and she imagined her son playing in the fields of grass. But he wasn't alone in that dream. He was with the boy who had appeared in his hospital room. Then the mysterious boy was there with her again. His smile and nod beckoned her to follow. And she did, though she had no idea why. The loudspeaker called her back to her son's room and tragic circumstances. All the monitoring equipment revealed little Tommy's struggle for life had ended. until the mysterious boy appeared and the monitors came back to life. Most incredible. 
incredible recovery I've ever seen. It's as if he never had the disease in the first place. Well, Tommy, we thought for a while there we'd lost you. I didn't go far. I was playing with my new friend Johnny. Son, you've been here in the hospital. You've been really sick. I feel look, that's where I was all this time. And Johnny was there too. Well, I'm glad somebody's been having a good time. <laughs> but it's true, he took me there. Well, I don't care where you went, you're here now. Oh, uh, Father, thanks for all your help. And I guess I was wrong about that. Oh, who knows, really? But it's good to have a little faith sometimes. Wait a minute. That's him. Yes, that's St. John Newman when he was a little boy. No, no, I mean, that's the little boy I kept seeing. He was here. That's my friend Johnny. Michelle and I hope this story and all the other cases we've reviewed here have given you the opportunity to examine the possibility of miracles. Our research team will continue preparing stories for next week. In the meantime, ask yourselves, could it be a miracle? To explain the unexplainable is no simple task. But it is the challenge that drives the staff at the Miracle Research Center. We'll return next time to continue our pursuit of miracles and a deeper understanding of them. Meanwhile, think about what you've seen and ask yourself, could it be a miracle? Until next time, I'm Robert Culp. Laudable stay.